Yo, what's up? My name is Mike Falabi. I'm a freelance creative director giving people tools to better tell their stories. And one thing that I've learned over my years of being an editor, photographer, and videographer is that there are things that are expensive that you need to buy and things that are expensive that you don't need to buy. Um, in this video, we're going to be talking about the latter. These are five unsexy, expensive things that will help you tell your stories and do what you got to do a little bit better. Tool number one is storage. And it's hard, especially when you're at the beginning of your career, to know how much storage you're going to need. I remember when I first started, I got I got one of them. I think they're over here somewhere. I got one of these Lacy or Lacy drives. I think this one was like a one terabyte. And I remember I started off just doing photography and a little bit of video. And I was like, oh, I'll be able to fill this up in five, six, seven years or whatever the case is. That's when I was back shooting on my uh, Canon 5D Mark III. So file size is a lot smaller. And I was like, this will hold me for a while. Fast forward, I start shooting some concert photography and going on tour, upgrade to this five terabyte LeC drive. It's a chunky boy. Uh, and I thought this was going to hold me off for a while. Also started shooting more videos, switched to Sony, and I just started getting a bunch of these. I probably have like six or seven of these. These are not smart ways to store uh, footage that you really need. One, these are spinning drives. So if you remember back in the olden days when we had CDs and they got scratched, just like these, these can get corrupted. Sure, they have this tough protectant on it, but I don't trust this to keep my files stored safely for a long time, especially when you start working with bigger clients and you need to make sure that all of your stuff is properly backed up. This was a good temporary solution, but for anything long-term, this is not the way to go. And these are obviously they're gonna be the cheapest ones that you find. You can get these for a hundred bucks, a couple hundred bucks or whatever. And I know that these five terabyte ones might be enticing. Just like, oh, I'll throw all of my projects backed up on there. I wouldn't recommend that just knowing that these drives can fail. Then I upgraded to these Samsung T5s. I really like these drives. They're super fast and reliable. There is no spinning disc in here. So you don't have to worry as much, obviously, about files getting corrupted. You can actually edit off of here. So I'll normally put my project file on one of these so that I don't bog down my computer. These are a little bit pricier and obviously the more storage, the more expensive it's gonna be. But if you're working on smaller projects that are under 500 gigs, you shouldn't have to worry about spending a crap ton of money on them. Those you can get for fairly cheap, but that's just not gonna be a large storage solution. So for long-term storage, I've landed in kind of two separate camps. One of them being kind of like cloud services. So Dropbox, iCloud, different things like that, that allow me to share those files one, with my clients, and two, to be able to pull them up remotely if I ever need to. And also, I have a NAS system. What does it stand for? I think it's network, not the wrapper. Network attached storage. Uh, it's essentially a local drive that also doubles as a network. So you plug it into your internet connection and you can remotely access those files. Actually, I lied, I have a third long-term storage solution. It's this LACI. Uh, 12 or 16 terabyte uh, drive. It's just another spinning disc. Obviously it's not super secure, but it's just another option that I use sometimes for different projects. Just an example of my storage workflow. I'm editing a project that was shot with like 15 terabytes worth of footage. So I made proxies of all of those files, put them on my SSD and put the rest of the files in my NAS. If I ever need to get the like original files towards the end of the project. Um, and that's kind of just how I'll run it. I normally don't save all of the raw assets, especially with a with a project this large. I'll either like have the client get uh, external drive and kind of ship them all of their raw assets so that I don't have to keep all of those locally. But that's just a quick example of one way that this uh, storage solution works. All of my storage options are probably in the like seven to ten thousand dollars worth of just sheer storage. Not to mention all of my cloud stuff. Um, but it's just something that when you're starting to deal with bigger files and that many projects, and especially archiving projects from the last 10 plus years of my career, um, you're gonna wanna invest in as much storage as makes sense, obviously. The good thing about storage is that it's constantly getting cheaper. Um, the more advanced and mature technology gets, the cheaper it gets. So I remember when the first gen of these SSDs came out, they were super expensive, but they're getting cheaper and cheaper. And it's dope to see that getting into fast storage is getting cheaper. The second tool is a really solid tripod and it is not a glamorous purchase. It is something that I actually went way too long without purchasing. I've had my FX6 for probably a year and a half now. 
and fully rigged out, it can be 18, 20 pounds. And I've been using like a really cheap Magnus tripod that's probably weighted for like 12 pounds max. And what really made me pull the trigger was realizing I was putting 10 to $12,000 on top of a $100 tripod. That just doesn't make sense. Um, so I ended up pulling the trigger on the Sattler or Satchler. I don't, I realize I don't know how to pronounce any of the gear that I have, or is there like a real way to pronounce half of this stuff? Like, I feel like it's, what is it? Shure, Sure, Lacey, Lacey, Sattler, Satchler. Anyways, that's besides the point. I ended up pulling the trigger on the Sattler Active 6 fluid head, as well as the Flowtech. 75 carbon fiber tripod legs and when i tell you it actually makes a huge difference in workflow and just how much time it takes to get set up um, it really is a game changer being on set if i'm doing an interview shot where i have a couple cameras up and i have my flow tech set up and a regular tripod as a b cam it's like 10 times faster to get this thing up and running especially moving from its highest point to its lowest point. I'm not dealing with multiple latches and turning this and this knob and that knob, and especially how the fluid head works with the Flowtech flow legs, being able to balance without having to like unscrew that bottom thing and do that whole balancing game. I, I couldn't imagine a better tripod, honestly. It feels really well built and has a bunch of different features like the Flowtech legs expand all the way out to be basically flat to the floor. So that's a way that you can get like a hi-hat shot where normally you're having to get another separate rig to be able to get like a really low angle shot. And it booms up really high. The biggest thing for me is that I know when I'm putting my camera on this tripod that I can be confident that it's not going anywhere. That's just one less thing to have to worry about on set. If I kick one of the legs, I'm not worried about the whole thing flying over and breaking my camera. It's not something that's going to take your cinematography from zero to a hundred but all it does is make things a little bit more efficient. And I think the further I'm getting in my career, I'm realizing that it's not like drastic changes, but that it's more subtle things that make it a little bit easier to do. That extra five seconds that it takes to untighten those legs or un unlatch the whatever, or rebalance it, that I'm, I'm, say I gain five seconds each time I use this Sattler as opposed to a different tripod. Over the course of an, a 10 hour day shoot, like that, I can't tell you how much, how many minutes, if not an hour that I've said, it's probably dramatic. But <laughs> suffice it to say, I am saving a lot of time with this tripod and I'm glad that I made that purchase. It was not cheap, but I can definitely say that it was worth it. Tool number three isn't super specific to filmmakers, but it's definitely something that editors would take advantage of. And that is just good ergonomics, like a good chair, a good desk, good keyboard and mouse and on that whole thing. Uh, I'm turning 30 in a week. Uh, my back turns 75. I broke my back. I've always just been in whatever chair is there. This is actually the first chair that I've ever purchased. It's always just like whatever chair was there in the office prior to me being there. I'd never like spent time to think about how important it is, especially when I'm on projects that I'm editing eight hours a day for weeks on end. Um, it's something that's super important and being able to leave my office after editing all day and not be in pain is is dope. Like I, it got to the point where I had to go to physical therapy and figure out what was wrong with my back. And they're like, oh, how are you sitting? Or what chair are you sitting in? And then I told them and they're like, you need to get a better chair. Obviously I ignored them when they showed me how many thousands of dollars some of these chairs could be. I can genuinely say that this chair has made an impact in how long I can edit, how comfortable I am while I'm editing. And when I stand up, I don't feel like I'm, my back is about to seize up or anything. If you saw my last video, you know that I got the Herman Miller Embody gaming chair, which is a very expensive chair. This is another thing that I didn't realize could be that expensive until I went to physical therapy. Like I said, I went to the Herman Miller store. I tried all the different chairs. I've tried the autonomous ones and I've tried a bunch of different brands and really like spent time researching which ones are the best. I actually found a YouTube video. I'll link it below if I can find it. Um, they went through like hundreds of chairs and they kind of narrowed down like the top 10. And this one landed up there for them. I tried it out. I really liked it and I purchased it. 
not saying to go get a thousand dollar chair, but think about the things that you're going to be interacting with daily and putting your money and investing it in that. There's a lot of other things that YouTubers talk about on here in getting cool anamorphic lenses like I'm shooting on. Not saying don't get them, but when you don't have a chair that's comfortable <laughs> to sit in, when you don't have a tripod to support that said anamorphic chair, uh, anamorphic chair, anamorphic lens, uh, then you're kind of doing the wrong thing or doing it out of order. And I'm not saying this from like judgment. This That was literally me. I'm the person who got the anamorphic lens before I got a tripod that could support the weight. I'm the one that got the crazy dual, I guess technically triple monitor setup before having a comfortable chair that I could sit in as I'm editing. So this isn't to say that uh, you have to do it the way that I did it. I'm actually telling you not to do it the way that I did it. So back to the chair, I've had it for probably two weeks now. Um, so preliminary kind of thoughts about it. It is really comfortable. It is really customizable. It's one of those things where your body gets used to being in a good chair and you're like, oh, it's actually not that much different than it was before. Then I accidentally will sit in my other chair over there. That's like a $40 Ikea chair and like instantly pain. So <laughs> it's one of those things where uh, it is super comfortable. I love that I can like recline it a lot if I want to, um, that it also has this like kind of upright mode that sometimes I need to put myself in, especially when I'm editing or when I want to focus on something. It's easy to like start reclining and not realizing that you're using muscles that you're not supposed to just be engaging for that long. Um, so being able to like have this upright mode gives me the ability to just really focus on what I'm doing. The armrests, everything feels really well built. And the cool thing is if my wife ever wants to use this chair, um, it's super customizable in its height and even like its leg length, like the leg part extends out so that if you have longer legs or shorter legs, you can move it from there. And it, yeah, it's just super uh, modular. And I love uh, a chair that adapts to as you grow um, or even just having different people as you grow, as if like a, what a, you're going to get this for your four year old and then he's going to have it for the rest of his life. That's crazy. As far as like standing desks and all the other ergonomic things, I actually am in the market for a standing desk. Um, I'm realizing that as good as a chair can be, the human body wasn't meant to sit down for eight plus hours a day. Um, so I'm looking at getting a standing desk. I'm kind of in the middle of getting a couple different, or looking at a couple different ones and maybe buying two and reviewing them and seeing which one I like better, returning the other one. If you guys have any suggestions to standing desks that you like, feel free to drop them in the comments. That would be much appreciated. Tool number four is just having a good variety of rigging tools. Uh, one thing that I've learned over the years of shooting different types of video is that there's not like a one size fits all set. If you're shooting a documentary, that's something that you'd, you'd, you'd have a kit that's built differently than if you're shooting a commercial, than if you're shooting a short film or a movie, like all of those things require different rigging tools and just tools in general. So I think having a, a bunch of different little like bits and bobs, I guess, if you want to call them that help you kind of build a bunch of different sets. Camera builds are honestly one of my favorite things about videography. I'm, I'm a nerd at heart when it comes to gear stuff. I love the challenge of building different camera sets. It feels like Lego, honestly, just like figuring out how to piece it together for a specific purpose. Tool number five is technically not a physical tool, but I mean, I guess if you print it out, it is, uh, it's contracts. I'm glad I went to school for photography and videography because that's one thing they put us on to really early was the importance of ironclad contracts. That is the quickest way to not get finessed by big companies. That is the quickest way to make sure that your client is clear on the deliverables and the timeline and not have to worry about going back and forth and different things like that. Uh, it's just super important to protect yourself, honestly. It can get expensive if you're going to like an, an entertainment lawyer and trying to get contracts from them. But there's companies like, I think it's Jacob Owens. If I can find it, I'll put it in the description. He gives a bunch of different type of contracts. That's like production agreements, uh, DP agreements. If you're getting extras, um, if you're shooting like a music video and you need extras, getting like uh, liability waivers and all of those things, he has like packs that are super helpful. So I would go check out those. It's not like sponsored or anything. Um, I just think that they're really helpful, especially when you're starting out. I can't tell you how many times I've added things to my contract 
after realizing the importance of them. For example, like recently I had a shoot that I shot like a year and a half ago. I sent them the first edit, no response. After like six months, I kept hitting them back. Hey, any update, any feedback, nothing. And then like a week ago, they hit me and were like, hey, we're ready to start up this project. I'm like, I didn't realize that I should have put a clause in there that's like after a certain amount of time, we got to renegotiate a contract or something because I'm not just going to be sitting here waiting on your beck and call. But suffice it to say, get a contract to protect yourself. That's pretty much it. Those were kind of the five and a half uh, unsexy tools uh, that will one, help your life be a little bit easier and two, help you focus on your craft and not have to worry about all the little extra things. Spend more money on the core main things. You're gonna upgrade your camera eventually, you're gonna upgrade your lenses eventually, your monitor, all of those things. But as long as you have the foundation, quite literally the foundation of a tripod or a chair that you're gonna be sitting in for a long time, all of those different types of things, then you can build off of that. So not spend your money crazy on all of these things, but start with the things that are most important. Uh, yeah, that's, that's pretty much it. I'll see you guys in the next video. Later.